All right. Good morning. My name is David Candland. I'm the user interface uh, design lead over at Bungie. I've been with the company for 17 years this month. And uh, whew, yeah, <laughs> I started off, so that would make it 2000 when I started. Um, and I started off as our website designer. And uh, uh, after several months in, I was approached by, by my boss, who was uh, Max Hoberman at the time. He said, uh, Dave, um, we have this game that everybody's working on called Halo, and we need a UI for it. And well, you're basically the closest thing we have to a game UI designer here at the studio, and so would you be willing to work on the, on the game for us? Uh, well, needless to say, I was absolutely ecstatic for this opportunity. Um, there was about 30 of us at the studio at the time, uh, and they were all working on the game, and I really wanted to be part of that. Uh, but since then, I became dedicated to game UI design and uh, worked on the game Halo, and then Halo 2, Halo 3, Halo 3 ODST, Halo Reach. <laughs> we got tired of doing sequels, so Destiny, and now Destiny 2. So um, looking back, I've been pretty happy with the way that uh, the original Halo came out, the UI for that. Considering how quickly I had to throw that together and to develop it on a platform that didn't exist yet. As, as we were working on this, they would frequently change the uh, certification requirements for the platform. Uh, so it was like hitting a moving target. But recently, I've been going back through and replaying the Halo games with my daughter on co-op. And uh, of course, I can't help but look at my past work and notice all the little things that didn't quite get pulled off the way I wanted them to for one reason or another. And I'll recognize that sometimes the uh, weaker implementations were just newbie mistakes. Sometimes they were due to, you know, lacking the iteration time to adapt and to play tests and feedback. Sometimes the correct implementation of a feature uh, was just going to be too costly. And sometimes it was caused by blindly fielding requests that I received from other designers at the studio. And it's the latter of these things that I wanted to talk to you today about. So tell me if you've ever heard anything like this at your studio. <laughs> Players aren't doing what we want them to, so let's just throw up a tutorial dialogue. Let's make this red, or blink, or better yet, blink red. <laughs> this feature is more important than all the others like it, so we need to bypass the regular UI and present it in a special way. All right, yes, you've heard that, <laughs> okay. Um, it's a running gag in the entertainment industry that people will say, um, well, well, we'll fix that in post, or we're gonna need to auto-tune that, or yeah, we can fix that with Photoshop. Uh, but if you ever come across somebody at your studio that says, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna fix this in UI, uh, my, my hope is that there are things that I can discuss today that may be able to help you with approaches and insight how to handle requests like this um, that are using UI as a, as a crutch rather than a way of enhancing the player experience. So there's this saying that kind of goes around in UI circles. Good UI is like telling a joke. If you have to explain it, it's probably not that good. Uh, a common mistake that we as devs make in game development is when an aspect of the game is a little complex or confusing, there's this temptation to kind of coddle the player uh, by pausing the game and explaining how things work by using an unskippable, uh, text-heavy tutorial dialogue window. For that matter, I've seen games that pause the game and throw up a tutorial dialogue window when the concept is not that complex. Uh, nothing disrupts the flow of a game more than stopping the action to put up a UI window, taking control away from the player to give them a paragraph of text how to explain how everything works. Uh, one of my favorite discussions on this uh, concept is, uh, was given by Blizzard's Dan Emmons. 
uh, as he discussed the brilliance of the level design in Super Mario World 1-1. Um, you can find this discussion on the Design Club YouTube channel. But uh, he explains how the uh, player is given hints, clues, and affordances and opportunities to learn how to play the game as they go along. Uh, this has the benefit of A, uninterrupted game flow, and B, even better, letting the player feel um, smart about accomplishing and discovering the, the way things work. Now, if we were to pause the action <laughs> and stick up a tutorial in the player's face during situations when the player can freely explore and discover like this, uh, it's much like a designer's way of talking down to the player. And to the player, it can feel very kind of condescending. And, it, and it's, as if, it's as if you're saying, I don't believe that you're capable of understanding this. So I'm going to spoon feed this for you. Uh, to all the UI designers here, if you haven't experienced this already, I can pretty much guarantee that there will be times when you will be approached by somebody that will say something along these lines. Uh, we're finding that people just don't get the concept of X. Uh, will you make a tutorial dialogue that explains this? Now, the simple thing to do would be to go right along with that request and just do it. And in some cases, the feature is complex enough, uh, important, testing portly, or uh, just uh, requires this approach. But uh, probably, uh, that, that could be the right course of action. We have several of these in our current game that we have out right now. But I would suggest there are many times that there are things that the game designers can do to avoid resorting to a big block of text to help the player learn a gameplay concept. Uh, this is in those types of situations that I would challenge each of you to respond by thinking through the situation and open up a conversation with the designer or the person making the request to discuss the potential of an alternate means of conveying this certain information to the player. Sometimes I need reminded myself of this. When we were working on the Destiny 1 uh, UI, I caught wind of this new feature that was going into the game. Uh, it was called the Raid. For those of you that aren't familiar with this, the Vault of Glass Raid as um, a uh, Destiny 1 end game activity for high level, very experienced players. And to do it requires a full fire team of six people and a lot of coordination to, to complete. I swung by the desk of Luke Smith, who was the uh, person overseeing the raid design of the game, and I inquired about what kind of UI features he is going to need for us to be able to, to pull this feature off. Usually, uh, this kind of thing involves several meetings. Uh, it'll need to have some impact on our schedule if we hadn't previously planned for it. And uh, needless to say, I was quite surprised when he just gave me this big grin and said something along the lines of, well, if we're successful, we won't need any UI for this feature. Uh, I then kind of pressed him for details and said that uh, uh, he said that he wants players to go in with, uh, with no preconceived notions about what to do. But through clues, observation, and affordances, teams would be able to figure out the mechanics of uh, the raid simply by um, coordinating with each other to, to accomplish the goals. And when there was a failure in the, the, the experience and the whole fire team died, there would be hints and clues in the types of stats that we would display in our post-game carnage report that would come up at the end of the round. So when I heard this, I'll admit that I was a bit dubious about how I was going to, uh, how this all was going to shake out with little to no communication from the UI. Some of the mechanics he was talking about were extremely complicated and uh, however, once I was able to participate in a raid with five other players, I found that not only had we made something that had very intricate mechanics that people could achieve with very little help from the UI, but the act of discovery became nearly as rewarding of an experience as the loot that dropped from the bosses at the end of, uh, of the level. And um, 
completing a raid in Destiny has become one of my all-time favorite co-op experiences of any game that I've ever played. Uh, this one, however, uh, comes in a close second. Even outside of expert player experiences as significant as the raids in Destiny, there are many ways that we can convey behaviors without requiring a UI screen to explain everything. As designers, part of our job is to challenge people that make UI requests when there are better, more appropriate ways to uh, be able to help the player learn. Could we convey the desired behavior by requiring the player to discover the behavior in order to exit the level? Are there visual or sound effects that we can use to help the player discover the correct responses? When the user experiences their own discovery to learn things, they feel elevated by the game. Uh, the game Portal pictured here is a, is a shining example of this. Now you may be thinking to yourself that this may sound kind of counterintuitive. If your job is to create UI, uh, most people probably wouldn't think that a UI designer would be helping investigate ways to, to not create UI. Uh, but as UI designers, it's really a, our responsibility to ensure that the UI and the features that we have are used in appropriate ways. That said, there are many cases in player education that the best approach may be through UI. Sometimes this is a tutorial, but not necessarily. Sometimes the UI can be utilized and designed in a way that uses visual cues and animations like these to draw the attention of the player to fulfill the goals instead of using text. The nice thing about this approach is that the visual cues through animation come up any time that it is needed rather than through a one-time experience uh, of, of a text-based education uh, while the player is just learning the game and taking in all of this new information. So besides the aforementioned problems with a lengthy box of block of text in tutorial dialogues, one of the biggest issues I have yet to mention is the fact that many people just simply don't read when the text is a roadblock in, in, in front of them uh, gating their entertainment. They, they just don't want to. Um, games in particular, they have come to relax and enjoy and be entertained and disrupting their gameplay with required reading is just this hurdle that uh, requires effort that they weren't really in the mindset to jump over. And many people want to get past that as quickly as possible. I recall in one session, uh, specifically during the production of the original Halo, the uh, sandbox designer and I were watching a user research candidate uh, in that, or sorry, not candidate, but a participant uh, on the other side of a two-way mirror. And we were, I'm sorry to say, using a big old honking dialogue box to convey to the user how they were going to drive this hovercraft. Um, anyway, in our previous tests, people had been ignoring the dialogues when I put it up in the corner. So, for the second test, I did the next thing that I thought was appropriate, slapping it up in the middle of the screen, <laughs> completely obscuring the view of the person. I would say it would stay there until the player deliberately dismissed the tutorial. Now, we watched in horror as this person drove around the level just like this for what felt like an eternity. And there were even times when the guy would arch his back and nose up like this, like he was trying to look over, like that would help him look over the top of it. Eventually, after, after a while like this, he, he, he turned towards the mirror and said, um, hey, is there any way we can dismiss this thing? So at that point, the sandbox designer and I literally face palmed. And when I say literally, I mean that in the literal sense. Uh, it, I was so glad that that participant could not see us on the other side. Ultimately, this led to our shipping solution, which was pausing the game while the tutorial was up. Hey, it was my first real gig, uh, learn from my fail. Uh, on the plus side, however, we only showed this in the shipping game when the player was not playing on one of the harder difficulties, and we gated it so that it only showed up once per account, and it wouldn't come up again if they played it on a different difficulty or replayed the campaign. Um, now, 
in hindsight, though, if, if people were playing on easy little small screen prompts uh, that were displayed when needed, similar to the ones that we displayed in Destiny would have been a much better use of UI. Now in Halo 3, we introduced this concept of the message of the day. It would greet players when we had any major announcements to make and to prevent players from skipping this text without reading, uh, we would uh, have this little countdown on the dismiss button. You can see it in the lower right hand corner. Um, while this worked great in our initial studies, with individuals, we discovered later that this feature also fed an alternate behavior. When we invited participants into a multiplayer test, we found that many players were becoming so consumed with that little timer that they would focus all their energy right on that number and sit there and mash the button of their controller like this repeatedly so that as soon as that hit zero, it would bypass the thing. And they didn't even look at any of the text. Um, it was blocking their ability to dismiss the screen and they could not get rid of it fast enough. In hindsight, this screen could have probably been cut down to half to maybe a third of the, the, the text. Um, and I believe that more people would have gotten more out of this dialogue had we had less text. Uh, with as much as we had, many people just didn't read it. All right, can I see by a show of hands how many of you read this? Did you see the fluffy unicorns? Anybody see the, yeah, okay, like four of you. Okay, all right, it's the second to the last paragraph about midway through, okay. Um, anyway, there's definitely an amount of text that is this sweet spot for in-game reading, and this was definitely not it. So one way we solved this in Destiny is when we needed to convey a lot of information was to disseminate to the player in smaller, bite-sized chunks in the animation. We still had them wait several seconds before they could get the agree button to dismiss the dialogue, but when we animated it in, in this fashion, the player dwelt less on the time required to dismiss the, the message and uh, more on the message itself. All right, that's enough on that subject. Next, we're going to talk about the most commonly prescribed solution for making something more visible. Let's start off with a true story. Um, a few years ago, I, uh, we were in the process of closing out the original Destiny, and I had come across a bug on my plate, and it essentially said, many players are not setting an appropriate difficulty for the activity they are about to start. And as I started looking into this, the, paying close attention to the screen layout, I realized that I hadn't really optimized the layout for a natural progression for the game setup. The set destination and the difficulty button were stacked on the left, and the launch button was on the right. It, it was easy, I believed, that the player could overlook the difficulty setting since when we read a screen, we tend to read left to right and then in, in kind of this Z pattern uh, uh, down and then left to right again. And setting the destination, the player may easily overlook the fact that there is a difficulty setting that they had right below that. So my solution was to move the difficulty button between the activity selection button and the launch button. And this uh, required the player to actually drag their cursor across the button uh, to be able to get to the launch button. And, and this created this natural one, two, three progression. And once the content was updated, I resolved the bug as fixed. I was surprised, however, about a few weeks later to see this new related bug show up uh, on my plate that basically said, the, uh, make the difficulty button have a pulsing highlight on it. People still aren't clicking on it. Well. I was a bit discouraged since I was certain the solution that I had come up with had addressed the, the issue of visibility and the user thought process. I was also stressed that I was going to have to go to battle with uh, the people that logged the bug over not putting some gaudy call out that, that, that blinked on the screen, particularly if this problem was indeed still uh, manifesting itself. So during game development, um, a lot of the maps that we work on uh, on our local uh, machines um, 
are in various states of functionality and to keep things stable for us and to avoid a, you know, massive downloads, we'll often just keep a test map or two on our uh, local machine at the time so that uh, you know, we can av avoid that. And um, the ones we were using did not have a difficulty setting uh, assigned to it. And so uh, we weren't able to really see this uh, uh, of the true implementation until the mission designers had actually gone through and uh, assigned a, an appropriate difficulty to some of the missions and we encountered them in a play test. Now, um, it was then that I realized that the, the player, to the player, um, there was a, 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 an issue with the difficulty. What they were seeing was the difficulty was normal. And to a player, when they see the word normal, they're thinking, oh, well, this is just right for me. So as I rewatched the recordings of the various UR studies, um, I, I picked up on this and, and realized that I found that the difficulty levels that were being assigned to activities were actually an absolute static value uh, instead of being relative to the player level. This meant that a mission that I may play when I was level three at normal difficulty would still appear normal even when I was level 20. So cranking the visibility of the button up uh, would not have helped. We had to fix the way that we were defining difficulty as a value relative to your current player ability. We had to display a more appropriate relative difficulty there instead. And while difficulties in Destiny don't become ridiculously trivial when you overlevel an activity, we do want players to challenge themselves a bit so that they have to work a little bit more and yield a greater reward in both the, the game and in their sense of accomplishment. But the lesson I learned from this particular example is this. Anytime you receive a fairly prescriptive request to just do X, you really need to find out why. What are the goals that this request is trying to accomplish? Is the feature, uh, if a feature isn't testing well, watch the tests. Try and understand what's going through the player's mind and push for a different solution if you find that the request or prescribed bug fix is not actually getting to the heart of the problem. Uh, when we are blindly fulfilling requests without context, we could actually be making the problem worse rather than better. All right, so now we've got this one to address. Uh, this request to break from the constraints of the current information architecture. At a larger studio, if you were to go around and speak to some of the different designers on your team and ask them which new feature is going to be the most important one in the game, Odds are that they are going to say it is the, currently the one that they are working on. Um, we're all proud of our work. Uh, it's human nature to be proud of our contributions and, and the things that we brought into the project. It's kind of like the one ring. It's very precious to us. Now, oftentimes, this will lead to a special request that uh, we get from a designer that goes something like this. This activity is, is different from all the others like it. It needs to go in a special place in the UI that grabs the player's attention. Uh, it can't go in the normal information hierarchy. Uh, it needs to bubble up to the top and maybe even put a shortcut to it on the main menu. Sometimes requests like this are totally valid uh, and they warrant special treatment, but oftentimes if this precious feature is really just would fit logically within the categorization that your interface is information architecture already has clearly defined, you'll most likely create confusion for the user if the feature is drawing unexpected attention to it and placing it out of the expected location. All right, so catering to requests like this can also send you into this uh, battle of one-upmanship, of competing elements vying for the player's attention. You may ship a game on a, pro uh, on a portable device that has a really uh, neatly categorized main menu that has four items in it. But then a new feature is added. It's of type B, but much cooler, and it's a special B, and so you're asked to give it its own slot outside of the B hierarchy. But then we need to add more items to the A button, and so now the A needs a blammy on it, 
to advertise this. Then we find out that uh, A and B are kind of dominating the hierarchy when C should be really the most important. So we've been asked to make it red. But then the odor of B plus really doesn't like that it's taking away from its former glory. And so in the next update, we get B plus plus. But now <laughs> nobody is clicking on poor option B. So it becomes blinking and yellow. And now we have Times Square or the Las Vegas Strip. It's just sensory overload. Okay, all right, I'm being a little facetious, but we have all seen this happen to a lesser degree in many games that are updated on a regular schedule. Uh, and more often than not, ones that are meant to encourage player spending. Uh, the problem is when everything is uniquely loud, uh, the clarity and usability are diminished from the original product. But let's say we sidestep the, the gaudy attention-grabbing deviations, but still brought new features to the top level instead of where they naturally belong in the hierarchy. Even if you are able to filter the noise, you run into issues with cognitive load. Our short-term memory lasts about 15 to 30 seconds and stores about seven items at a time. Once our game screen exceeds that number of choices, uh, we've started forcing our users into this kind of um, trial and error methodology as they search for the feature that they're, they're wanting to play. So the important thing is that the, if the feature logically fits within the existing categorical hierarchy and does not warrant a new entry into your menu or other UI structure, you may find that the integrity of the interface requires that you insist that the UI adhere to the existing hierarchy that you defined uh, when you get a request like this. Now, during pre-production, it's important to include the various disciplines and feature stakeholders in on this discussion so that there aren't any surprises. And more importantly, that if you are pressured to deviate from uh, this and make an exception for their, their precious ring, um, that you can refer them back to the alignment that you had during pre-production when they were there and bought off on this information architecture. Now, depending on the studio culture, that may not always work. Uh, and particularly if you're in a situation where your game is funded wholly by microtransactions that demand attention-grabbing visibility, uh, it would be a good idea to plan into the design a special location wherever the latest one ring uh, is for each release, and then when we design that space with, with intent, um, it not only becomes more compelling because we have framed it appropriately, but it gives off much less of this kind of slapped on appearance that tends to cheapen the player's perception of the game's quality. So really what it comes down to is a early coordination with other teams and designers. One of the big things that I would really like to see gone uh, from this industry is this thought of UI as a service, something that is just added on top as an extra layer once the game or features are nearly complete. I found that the most successful feature designs that require UI come from a coordinated creative process that involves UI from the beginning with the people that are designing the features. So in Destiny 2, one of the big shifts that we made in our activity flow was this notion of play and destination, where players would be encouraged to roam around a destination, discover activities, and launch them from totems in the world. Being a part of the design team that planned this feature, I was able to help guide, direct, and participate in, in the creative process. At one point, we had started going down this design direction that would have really taken us into a flow that um, uh, may have given us flexibility in the fire team uh, roles, but at the cost of adding a really complex voting system that could um, really have been disruptive to players that are currently in combat. Uh, having an embedded UI designer on the team helped us avoid getting locked into a user experience that could have resulted in this complexity and a frustrating uh, interface experience. So, we're still learning there is room for improvement at Bungie, but this methodology of gaining momentum uh, is gaining momentum in our company's design process of, of embedded UI designers. Uh, if you find that UI is treated as an afterthought or a final phase of design where you work, then I would challenge you to look for ways to help your coworkers understand the importance of engaging and refactoring UI, or factoring in UI at the early phases of the design feature process 
After all, there's a reason why user interface and user experience are used often in concert with each other. Involving the former in the early phases of the feature design can only enhance the latter. And with that, um, I open it up to questions. I love your work. Thank I've been you. like staring at you in the halls and be like, oh my God, I need to say something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but sometimes you also make my life a bit difficult. I don't know how, I work at Avalanche Studios in Stockholm and I don't know how many times like during pre-production a game designer came to me and was like, are we implementing the destiny cursor? <laughs> uh, but it's not only you. Uh, also, Horizon Zero Dawn comes out, and that's what they want to do. Or like, I had mm -hmm. a 45-minute meeting about basically do it like in Titanfall 2. Right. Um, so, what uh, could you like give me some tools, uh, uh, like about how I speak with people when I get these requests? Like, what should I? How? How? What? Why? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um. You know, I, I think it would be naive to say that none of us borrow from other people's work um, because that's, uh, we're all influenced by each other. Um, that's just part of the process. Um, uh, but I would, I would think that it, it would probably be worth uh, talking to them about how involved this is going to be and if the, the, the payoff is going to be worth the amount of, of effort and work that it's required to, to be able to pull this off and, and, and if that happens at the cost of what other feature. Um, sometimes you say, yeah, I mean, sure we could do that, but then we couldn't do this other feature if we were to put that much time into it and that, that you know, maybe sometimes that is the right thing. Maybe it is the right thing to 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 put more effort into this this feature at the cost of another one. But uh, when people understand that there is a, you know, nothing is free. That there's, it's going to take time, and that you have to pull off from something else. Then then maybe it'll help them, kind of consider that a little more um, in their in their factoring of whether or not they really want this or or not. Um, but you know, if, if people are interested in the cursor, I gave a talk at GDC a couple of years ago all about how we how we did that thing, and it's probably worth looking at if, if that's something that you're considering. It is awesome. All right, Yay. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but we would never get time to do that. All right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, when when we first started it, uh, Jason Jones, who's our studio head, uh, design head, he he basically said, you know, we've got to. Uh, We've got to put as much time into this as we put into the auto aim on the Halo crosshair. That was something that our sandbox designers spent a ton of time on, and making sure that felt good and felt right was was really important. So, thank you.